Hello friends, this is the third story in my series of short stories. Today's story is The Hitchhiker by Roald Dahl. I had a new car. It was an exciting toy, a big BMW 3.3 liters, which means 3.3 liters long wheelbase fuel injection. It had a top speed of 129 miles per hour and terrific acceleration. The body was pale blue, the seats inside were darker blue and they were made of leather. Genuine soft leather of the finest quality. The windows were electrically operated and so was the sunroof. The radio aerial popped up when I switched on the radio and disappeared when I switched it off. The powerful engine growled and grunted impatiently at low speeds. But at 60 miles an hour, the growling stopped and the motor began to purr with pleasure. I was driving up to London by myself. It was a lovely June day. They were haymaking in the fields and there were buttercups along both sides of the road. I was whispering along at 70 miles per hour, leaning back comfortably in my seat with no more than a couple of fingers resting lightly on the wheel to keep her steady. Ahead of me, I saw a man thumbing a lift. I touched the brake and brought the car to a stop beside him. I always stopped for hitchhikers. I knew just how it used to feel by standing on the roadside watching the cars go by. I hated the drivers for pretending they didn't see me especially the ones in big empty cars with three empty seats. The large expensive cars seldom stopped. It was always the smaller ones that offered you a lift, or the rusty ones, or the ones that were already crammed full of children, and the drivers would say, I think we can squeeze in one more. The hitchhiker poked his head through the open window and said, Going to London, Governor? Yes, I said. Jump in. He got in and I drove on. He was a small, ratty-faced man with grey teeth. His eyes were dark and quick and clever, like rat's eyes, and his ears were slightly pointed at the top. He had a cloth cap on his head and he was wearing a greyish-coloured jacket with enormous pockets. The grey jacket, together with the quick eyes and the pointed ears, made him look like, more than anything, like some sort of large human rat. What part of London are you headed for? I asked him. I am going right through London and out the other side, he said. I am going to Epsom for the races. It's derby day today. So it is, I said. I wish I were going with you. I love betting on horses. I never bet on horses, he said. I don't even watch them run. That's a stupid, silly business. Then why do you go? I asked. He didn't seem to like that question. His ratty little face went absolutely blank and he sat there staring straight ahead at the road, saying nothing. I expect you help to work the betting machines or something like that, I said. That's even sillier, he answered. There's no funny working them lousy machines and selling tickets to mugs. Any fool could do that. There was a long silence. I decided not to question him anymore. I remembered how irritated I used to get in my hitchhiking days when drivers kept asking me questions. Where are you going? Why are you going there? What's your job? Are you married? Do you have a girlfriend? What's her name? How old are you? And so forth and so forth. I used to hate it. I'm sorry, I said. It's none of my business that you do. The trouble is, I'm a writer, and most writers are terribly nosy. You write books? He asked. Yes. Writing books is okay, he said. It's what I call a skilled trade. I'm in a skilled trade too. The folks I despise is them that spend all their lives doing crummy old routine jobs with no skill in them at all. You see what I mean? Yes. The secret of life, he said, is to become very, very good at something 
That's very, very hard to do. Like you? I said. Exactly. You and me both. What makes you think that I'm any good at my job? I asked. There's an awful lot of bad writers around. Ha! You wouldn't be driving about in a car like this if you weren't no good at it? He answered. It must have cost a tidy pocket, this little job. It wasn't cheap. What can she do flat out? He asked. 129 miles an hour. I told him. I bet she won't do it. I'll bet she will. All car makers is liars, he said. You can buy any car you like and it'll never do what the makers say it will in the ads. This one will. Open her up then and prove it, he said. Go on, governor. Open her up and let's see what she'll do. There is a traffic circle at Chalfont St. Peter and immediately beyond there's a long straight section of divided highway. We came out of the circle onto the highway and I pressed my foot hard down on the accelerator. The big car leaped forward as though she had been stung. In 10 seconds or so we were doing 90. Lovely, he cried. Beautiful, keep going. I had the accelerator jammed down against the floor and I held it there. 100, he shouted. 105, 110, 115. Go on, don't slack off. I was in the outside lane and we flashed past several cars as though they were standing still. A green Mini, a big cream-coloured Citroen, a white Land Rover, a huge truck with a container on the back, an orange-coloured Volkswagen minibus. 120, my passenger shouted, jumping up and down. Go on, go on, get her up to 129. At that moment, I heard the scream of a police siren. It was so loud, it seemed to be right outside the car, and then a cop on a motorcycle loomed up alongside us in the inside lane and went past us and raised a hand for us to stop. Oh, my sainted aunt, I said, that's torn it. The cop must have been doing about 130 when he passed us, and he took plenty of time slowing down. Finally, he pulled to the side of the road and I pulled in behind him. I didn't know police motorcycles could go as fast as that. I said rather lamely. That one can. It's the same make as yours. It's a BMW R90S. Fastest bike on the road. That's why they're using none. The cop got off his motorcycle and leaned the machine sideways onto its prop stand. Then he took off his gloves and placed them carefully on the seat. He was in no hurry now. He had us where he wanted us and he knew it. This is real trouble, I said. I don't like it one little bit. Don't talk to him more than necessary, you understand? My companion said. Just sit tight and keep mum. Like an executioner approaching the victim, the cop came strolling slowly towards us. He was a big meaty man with a belly and his blue breeches were skin tight around enormous thighs. His goggles were pulled up onto the helmet, showing his smouldering red face with wide cheeks. We sat there like guilty schoolboys waiting for him to arrive. Watch out for this man, my passenger whispered. He looks mean as the devil. The cop came around to my open window and placed one meaty hand on the sill. What's the hurry? He said. No hurry, officer, I answered. Perhaps there's a woman in the back having a baby and you're rushing her to the hospital. Is that it? No, officer. Or perhaps your house is on fire and you're dashing home to rescue your family from upstairs. His voice was dangerously soft and mocking. My house isn't on fire, officer. In that case, you've got yourself into a nasty mess, haven't you? Do you know what the speed limit is in this country? Seventy, I said. And do you mind telling me exactly what speed you were doing just now? I shrugged and didn't say anything. When he spoke next, he raised his voice so loud 
but I jumped. 120 miles per hour, he barked. That's 50 miles an hour over the limit. He turned his head and spat out a big gob of spit. It landed on the wing of my car and started sliding down over my beautiful blue paint. Then he turned back again and started hard at my passenger. And who are you? He asked sharply. He's a hitchhiker, I said. I'm giving him a lift. I didn't ask you, he said. I asked him. Have I done anything wrong? My passenger asked. His voice was soft and oily as hair cream. That's more than likely. The cop answered. Anyway, you're a witness. I'll deal with you in a minute. Driver's license? He snapped, holding out his hand. I gave him my driver's license. He unbuttoned the left-hand breast pocket of his tunic and brought out the dreaded book of tickets. Carefully, he copied the name and address from my license. Then he gave it back to me. He strolled round to the front of the car and read the number from the license plate and wrote that down as well. He filled in the date, the time and the details of my offence. Then he tore out the top copy of the ticket. But before handing it to me, he checked that all information had come through clearly on his own carbon copy. Finally, he replaced the book in his breast pocket and fastened the button. Now you, he said to my passenger. And he walked around to the other side of the car. From the other breast pocket, he produced a small black notebook. Name, he snapped, Michael Fish. My passenger said, address, 14 Windsor Lane, Newton. Show me something to prove this is your real name and address. The policeman said. My passenger fished in his pockets and came out with a driver's license of his own. The policeman checked the name and address and handed it back to him. What's your job? He asked sharply. I'm an odd carrier. A what? An odd carrier. Spell it. H-O-D-C-A. That'll do. What's a hot carrier? May I ask? An odd carrier officer is a person who carries the cement up the ladder to the bricklayer and the odd is what he carries in it. It's got long handle on the top, he, you've got bits of wood set in an angle. All right, all right, who's your employer? Don't have one, I'm unemployed. The cop wrote this down in the black notebook, then turned the book to his pocket and did up the button. When I get back to the station, I'm going to do a little check-up on you, he said to my passenger. Me? What have I done wrong? The rat-faced man asked. I don't like your face, that's all, the cop said. And we might just have a picture of it somewhere in our files. He strolled round the car and returned to my window. I suppose you know you're in the serious trouble, he said to me. Yes, officer. You won't be driving this fancy car of yours again for a very long time. Not after we've finished with you. You won't be driving any car again. Come to that for several years. And a good thing too. I hope they lock you up for a spell into the bargain. You mean prison? I asked, alarmed. Absolutely, he said, smacking his lips. In a clink, behind the bars along with all the other criminals who break the law and the hefty fine into the bargain. Nobody will be more pleased about that than me. I'll see you in court, both of you. You'll be getting summons to appear. To know what happened next, like... What happened to the author? Did he go to the prison? Did he get the summon? What was actually the rat-faced man doing? What was his profession? What was the skilled trade that he was in? To know that, 
please tune in to my channel this saturday in the meantime if you have any further suggestions to improve the videos or if there's anything else you would like to hear please let me know in the comment section below thank you for watching guys if you like my stories do share subscribe and like this video thank you and have a great day